Beth House member video and is a part of the ongoing Force for Good class series. To learn more about this ongoing series, please visit TibetHouse.us. And this shows you that flat thing that we saw with the three buildings. This is only a one building mandala. It's, uh, it's again a Yamantika one. And this is without all the ornamentation and the texturing. Just gives you the basic idea. You go in the gate. In there is a thing with petals. It's a, it's a different kind of thing. Then you see the rafters. And so when you learn to do this kind of creation stage practice, you learn actually those beams are made of emerald or ruby, solid ruby or emerald or diamond, the white color is. They're all, it's all jewel plasma shaped like this, like jewel plexiglass, let's call it. And, the, and this, is the, this is the sort of wall structure. That's the ventilation thing in the tropical area palace. And the thing this is a very partial, but it just gives you an idea of how you rise from this, you see. How this actually is a three-dimensional thing, and I, I just couldn't find it just now. The, uh, there's one like this for the Kal Chakra, but I couldn't find. And um, you know, the, the Kal Chakra is kind of a skyscraper. The central palace in the Kal Chakra, and within the central palace, there's a little tower where Kal Chakra and the eight Shaktis uh, are, uh, which is a kind of little tower within the central building. And it's a, it, it's a really beautiful, it's an extraordinary thing, and all made of jewels. And these outer, these outer rows there, there are 88 uh, mantra letters there. And each of those mantra letters is the seed syllable of a deity. And in those deities, in those 88 things include, you know, the 12, uh, the 27 lunar mansions, the 12 uh, zodiac signs, the um, old people like Vishnu and Shiva, et cetera, there, another form of them are out there and uh, the days of the week, uh, days of the month, and so on. So there are all these like deities that constitute sort of ordinary time. That's the equivalent of the, of the charnel grounds that are outside the, the realm of the mandala. And uh, this is, the, the, although they're depicted here, on the wind circle, the dark colored circle there, uh, outside is the wind circle, you see. And then there's a water circle and a fire circle. And, and uh, as you go inward, you know, and uh, like that. And, um, and then these are blazing flames outside your universe, so no negative things can come into your universe when you're Kala Chakra. And it has a Vajra force field. Those yellow things you see there are a Vajra force field, which is spherical. And the flames that are shooting out of multicolored flames are also spherical, you know, although it's here as a flat circle. And then these buildings, and those, those Things that are lying flat coming out like that, those are actually gatehouses, three story gatehouses that go up, come up over the gates. But that's, that's how it's drawn. And the little floor of things you see out there, those are eave ornaments hanging from the eaves of the upper building. And so it's like a blueprint of the building, which they understand. And the way they make it is marvelous in the ritual, the monks. As you know, you've probably all seen them where they have this like wedding cake ornamenting type of cone and with a little rough thing on it, and they rub it with a, with a chopstick or a thing like that, and they make a little vibration, and then it creates a line of very fine powder, and then they have, they're have wearing bandanas like bandits, but that's not to breathe because the powder is so, it could easily be moved by the breath. And, uh, and then they make elaborate, extri exqu they make this exquisite thing with that, with that powder. And so this is a powder mandala, color particle mandala, initiatory mandala. It's amazing, actually, what they do, and they work out from inside. But when they're doing it, supposedly, I mean, the adept ones are, there's a ritual being performed by the monks around them who are reading it, although they've all memorized this little 120 single space, space thing. And they are, they are visualizing the whole mandala, the hologram is around them, the, the palace. And then certain main architectural lines in the palace they're imagining that they draw down and they embed it in lines in the two-dimensional thing. You follow me? They bring, they flatten the whole thing in a way cosmically into the two-dimensional thing. And then furthermore, they visualize that every tiny grain of the powder contains the whole mandala universe in it. 
And that's why when they later sweep up the powder and then they entrust it to the Nagas, the serpent water beings, the water serpent dragon snake beings in the ocean or through the rivers, uh, they, are, they feel that every grain, every grain of that powder has the whole mandala in it. There's the, like a Samantabhadra thing, like holographic vision of the universe. They completely are into that, evolving. So that's why that thing, and I had actually a super normal experience myself. In 1965, when I was an idiot monk, uh, before I was an idiot professor, don't worry. <laughs> I'm not implying anything. But when I was, first time I saw the powder mandala in Dharamsala in 1965, in a line, you know, I was, because I, well, I had a little privilege in the line because I was a monk, but I went around and, uh, and this voice spoke in my, my Walter Cronkite voice went off, you know, which is the voice of the divine or something, you know. It wasn't my voice, it was like Walter Cronkite. It was me, the ultimate, it always expresses himself, never as George Burns. George Burns used to play God, you know, but that never convinced me. God wouldn't smoke a cigar like that and behave like that. But, but uh, Cronkite was like, so that voice said to me, if human beings can make anything that beautiful, it is possible to attain Buddhahood. Okay, thanks, Walter. <laughs> so do I have CBS's guarantee of that? Yes, oh, great. <laughs> Something in my unconscious, probably. But it was really marvelous. And some of it, many of you, how many of you have seen it? One of the ones where the monks make it? We used to have it in our art shows even. We'd get them to come and make it. Good, I'm glad you have it. It is amazing. It's so vivid, and it has such an energy about it. It's a, and then they sweep it up, throw it away, which is amazing. Now, oh, this is the Hanksa Malavaraya. You know, the Kala Chakra Cosmic Mantra, Om Ahum Ho Hanksa Malavaraya Hum Pe, famous 10-syllable mantra. This is the Kala Chakra uh, yidam, you know, what, that's what you are, and you are both male and female, by the way, when you are that. This is serious transgender, because you, you can be, in your ordinary body, either male or female, doesn't matter, or both, but when you're visualizing yourself as Kala Chakra, you are both the male and the female in the, in the sadhana, which doesn't mean also not that in some, there are yogas in Kala Chakra where you work with a partner, but when you're vainly visualizing it, you are everyone. And unfortunately, we can't see in this um, uh, projection because of whatever that um, the side deities, but all of the, a lot of the main side deities are, you know, surrounding deities are in little cartouches around that thing. That's an old painting. And this is really, I like this one. And this is, you know, I know I don't like the background on this. Well, I don't want to do that now. But anyway, these are the, this is the great bliss wheel, what it's called. You know, there's, there's a body wheel, speech wheel, mind wheel, great bliss wheel, and uh, miraculous activity wheel even outside here. So there are five wheels. But, but this is the innermost wheel, the great bliss wheel. And there you are in the center as Mr. and Mrs. Kala Chakra. She has eight arms and she also has four faces. And uh, he, she's golden, her body golden color. He's black color, but his right leg is red and left leg is white. And um, then he, he has the 24 arms, which are red, white, and black. And she has eight arms, which are all gold. And, but then there are these eight goddesses around them called the eight shaktis, uh, powers, the eight energies. And what they are is eight of the 10 paramitas embodied. You know, dana paramita, shila paramita, that generosity, ethicality, tolerance, uh, creativity, uh, creativity, concentration, wisdom, uh, art, uh, prayer, power, and knowledge, and rain cloud of the Dharma. And uh, if that's 10, or maybe knowledge is the 10th, then rain cloud of the Dharma is the name of the state. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. And. Uh, and that, and she and he are, uh, she is three beings. She's Vishwamata, which is the same as Kala Chakra, but she also is Prajna Paramita and Jnana Paramita. She's wisdom, transcendence, and, and the sixth and the tenth Paramitas. So these are the other eight, these, these eight goddesses around. 
Each of them has four faces and eight arms, like her. And um, uh, this is correct because the, the black ones are in the down side, which is the east side, the direction he faces. And the red is the south, and the white is the north, north and northeast. And then the yellow and the northwest are the, are the, are the ones above. This is a very vivid. I think in the future I will not use the orange background for these slides. Then this is the, of course, these are the Kala Chakra chakras, because the Kala Chakra chakra system is a tiny bit different in some respects than the Guya Samaja and the other ones. And it makes more of a fuss about this super brain chakra, which is actually above your head. It's your Ushnisha chakra and the genital chakra, also having 32 petals below the navel chakra, where you have 64. The heart chakra still has eight. And then the, the, the throat chakra has more. It has uh, 32, actually, like the genital chakra. And uh, the brain chakra only has 24, because it has another chakra on top of it, five. You know. So there are six chakras in the Kala Chakra system. You know, there's the same central channel and same right and left channels, which you see are, and then the right and left channel go a little differently at the bottom part. So there, you know, that's all software programming. So, and then the Kala Chakra, okay, anyway, so okay, you have creation stage. Okay, now, in that creation stage, just, to, just so you realize what it is, you know, which is that we're not pretending that we can necessarily do this. Some of you may have the initiation, you may be working a little bit at it, and that's good to do. Even if you don't really fully know what you're doing, it sort of creates an affinity. When, when after you die in your next life or something, you'll have that affinity, or maybe some later time in this life. So it's important to sort of keep connected to, the part, to, the, to it, even if you're not that great about it. But it helps to be encouraged to do that, to know what it is. So what it is is, you know, and that's why you have to have some initial understanding of emptiness, which means that you understand that you are a work in progress. Because right now, in your sense of identifying yourself as an ordinary person with an ordinary body, you have a model of yourself in your brain, in your central nervous system. And brain is in the whole body, actually. So your central nervous system has a model of you in it. And you have two arms and you know, 10 fingers, et cetera, you know, the sense organs that you have, and the limbs and the muscles and all this. And you have a model of yourself as a tree-like thing like that, with these, ne these ganglia, these nexi, nexi, up and down the central channel, and then branching out into thousands and tens of thousands of nerve, nerve channels, and energy canals, and fluid, and nerves, and so on. And uh, so what you're doing in the creation stage is you're imagining that you melt all of that down. You let go of that. You become a pure awareness that is not invested automatically and indelibly in the model of yourself in your central nervous system. You then, uh, but you can't sort of think directly of the central nervous system necessarily. So you then think of yourself, if you're doing Kala Chakra, as being a male in union with a female, and you're sort of on both sides of that union. You're both the female and the male. That's already really complicated. <laughs> then you have three shoulder joints, three windpipes, and three necks. And uh, the back one somehow just hovers there without a neck. <laughs> I don't know how, the yellow one in the back. You have these three necks. You have six shoulders and three on each side. Then you have six upper arms. And then you have uh, 12 lower arms, uh, forearms, and hands. And they're different colors, etc. You only have two legs. And, um, but, you, but you actually have four legs because you also are the female. So you're this weird being. You're both of them. And, and you're very in love with this yourself. <laughs> the male part of you is in love with the female part of you, and the female part of you is in love with the male part of you. So you're very like that. But you're not just looking at each other because each of you has three other faces with three eyes in each face. And you're looking in all directions. So you're, you're aware of everything in all directions, plus this like, the way the chest chakra splits out into this fan of, of, of uh, things. And you're holding implements in each of them that symbolize specific mental powers and abilities and things, you know, tools for getting things done. 
And your body is made of pure time also. So, of course, at first, it, it's, you can't even, you have to even memorize all the things that are in the 24 hands. And you know that the colors of the backs of the fingers, thumb and fingers are different colors, the five wisdom colors. And the uh, front joints are red, white, and blue, red, white, and black. And the fingernails have different colors. So, I mean, it's complicated to do that. But if you visualize yourself, as you practice it bit by bit, and of course, it also helps if in your practice of the exoteric, you develop very good stability of mind, where you can concentrate on one thing without wavering quite strongly. Because then you concentrate on feeling like what it feels like to be in such an embodiment. And as you can see, what is the purpose of that? What it will feel like, there's one way of how it would feel externally, in a sense, that you'd be looking in all directions, you'd be sort of aware of everything all around you, and you would therefore be looking upon other beings around you in a mandala palace, although at the first minute you don't deal with that, you just sort of create yourself. And you're looking at all of these other beings, and yet you're feeling you're also them looking at you. You imagine that too. So you are all of them. You give birth to them, kind of, and there's a process in the sadhana where you give birth to them. And then, no, not only that, there's another process in the sadhana where you have all of them in different joints of your body. Like the 12 body, the 12 body uh, lotuses, which I showed you in the first powder mandala, you saw in the body mandala, they're in your wrists and elbows and shoulders and, uh, and, and hip bone, hip and knee and ankle. So there's 12, uh, 12 complete 30, 30 deity chakras in each of them. You know? And then you, uh, so you're completely made out of them as well. It's a body mandala thing what they call a body mandala. So, but anyway, that's more complicated. But when you, when you even just to do that, you can imagine if you were, had such a body to sort of wiggle one of your three middle red arms holding um, you know, an elephant goad with a noose in the other hand, uh, in, the, in the matching red hand, uh, to wiggle that, you have a whole different neural structure inside your chest, inside which is, it connects to your brain and your central nervous system. So what you're doing is, in, by imagining that, you're making a, uh, through using your imagination that way, you're creating a different openness and a greater sensitivity to the subtle patternings of the central nervous system. And you, and you reach the stage in the creation stage where that becomes so strong for you that you really feel that you are that body. Just like right now, I feel I'm this with my two arms. In that state, you feel you really have that. That's what you are. You feel like that. You feel what it feels like that. Can you, can you imagine that? So you've actually, you've created a sort of openness, but on the other hand, it's not stuck because you know that's not absolute, although you could maybe feel like, wow, I'm really called chakra. But you're not stuck in that because then you can leave the mandala, you can melt that down, and you can come back to being your ordinary self again. So you don't get stuck in some sort of psychotic, separate world where you can't come out of it. But apparently it feels really good to be a 24-arm, multicolored, three-colored person in union with an eight-armed, four-faced, golden person. Hi, Bo. Come on in. And uh, to, um, to feel that that's what you are, apparently that feels pretty good. Especially because uh, you imagine, of course, being Kala Chakra, you are not doing some ordinary, genitally organized sex. Although you're in union, in sexual union of a certain, you know, the organs are touching. But uh, they are, the, what they are doing is they are generating orgasmic energy all up and down the chakra system. So the orgasm is not just happening there in the bottom chakra, it's happening all the way up and down and flows back and forth up and down. And, and the, the ultimate place for it, of course, to stay is the heart, actually. And they only show the heart as eight petals because that's the immediate thing, but actually then it branches to being 24, which is very important, which, is, which the chakra sambar is especially very good at. So, so, and, and you have to do that, you have to develop that ability because 
then you're going into the, then when you reach the where you really can shift into being in that Kala Chakra universe, and you're the Kala Chakra in the Kala Chakra universe with your self replicated in a clan, kind of a bunch of clans and families, a tribe, of all, which are all you, you feel completely identified with all of them, you know. Um, when you do that, then you begin to do this subtle yoga where you begin to visualize the whole thing in your body everywhere and then in every atom of your body, and then you begin to go into the perfection stage. You begin to go into this where you start going through the process of death, the process of rebirth, and there are process of then re-emanation, and you start going into these things where if you didn't have this openness in the nervous system, you, would, you might actually die. And you might completely get freaked out, or you might go nuts, or whatever, you know, get so long, what they call it, become crazed. And all kinds of terrible things could happen to you. Which is why, you know, now the Nyingma, the Nyingma tradition, and that some, of the, some of the other tantric traditions in ancient India, because the Nyingma thing was, after all, formed at an earlier phase of the Indian tradition, began in the seventh century, and it really got strong in the eighth, ninth century, was when the Nyingma tradition sort of had its founding moments. And at that time, there was no Kala Chakra present in India, and uh, some of the more elaborate, uh, the whole literature of the commentaries, etc., had not developed because, not because they didn't exist, actually, and the knowledge wasn't there. The knowledge was there, we argue, and we insist, from Buddha's time, actually. And actually, internally, it was there from other worlds in the past. But in India, in you, on the planet Earth, it was there from, from Buddha's time, definitely. And we say, but they kept it genuinely secret for about 1,100 years from Buddha's time. They really didn't have text. They really kept it secret. Because, why? Because, you know, the initiation ceremony is like a royal consecration. Now, the kings of the earlier period in Indian civilization, different Indian nations, because there was many nations in India, they might not have appreciated some untouchables and some weird mix of people going out somewhere in a temple and like becoming kings, you know and having ceremonies that were reserved for them and their Brahmins. You know. It's not just sex or anything. It's the whole idea of the individual feeling, I'm a king, you know. You know? Remember Thomas Paine? You know, Common Sense, the American Revolution? Did you ever read that pamphlet, any of you in your American history book? He has this wonderful thing about how the crown of the king has these gems that represent the consensual will of the people, which are the gems of the love and trust and faith of the people. And what a revolution, what democracy is, where you shatter that crown, and then every being has a piece of the, one of the gems, you know, which is their vote, you know, their, their power, their own individual power. A beautiful symbol for democracy that he wrote. So the tantric thing is that. So they had to wait for India to develop uh, really, you know, the, through the monastic vehicle, through the general Mahayana, Bodhisattva vehicle, etc., to develop a stronger appreciation of the female, a less violent thing about the male, and a stronger sense of individuality overall, where people were, you know, where people were not afraid of feeling really that, you know, I can be king too, you know. You know, there's all those things about the yoga, and even when, of course, India always had that in a way. That's why Buddha chose India, because Indian, the, 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 the Vedic society was established by nomads. The so-called Aryans who came to India were nomads originally. So they had somewhere in the root of their culture this nomadic thing. And nomads are, tend to be more individualistic than people who live in cities. People live in agricultural cities, it's a hierarchy. They can know they have to deliver the grain over here, and then somebody processes it, and somebody else does that, and then they buy their shoes, etc. You know, cities develop this kind of thing where people fit into a group. You have castes, you know, you have different, different identities like that. Whereas the nomad, everybody kind of does everything, and they wander around, and they don't really follow the leader quite so much. They can't, because they have to raise their animals somewhere else, you know. which may have been one of the reasons why Tibetans took so much to it right away. But anyway, because if you look at it like that, from the time Tantra became public in India, more public in India, it was still esoteric, but it was more known. There was a literature, there was going to be a library. 
from the 6th century or so, about 1,100 years after Buddha. That's just very shortly after that, it starts to move into Tibet, actually. Interesting. Just thought of that myself. So this is why it's no joke, the Tantra, actually. And this is why the Dalai Lama says, when sometimes 100, you know, 200, 300,000 people come to the Kala Chakra, because it's kind of, Tibetan culture has become like a picnic or something. But he says, there might be one or two of us here able to really work on this. I'm not really qualified to give this initiation. You're not really qualified to receive it, but we go through it as a blessing. There's a tradition about it, he said. Someday in future lives, we'll all do it really like yogis, and we'll really know it and understand it. He always says that. I don't know if, you're, if some of you, if you've been there, if you know that. He invariably says that, which is very good to say. And it's very correct in a way, but of course, he is very qualified to do it, actually, himself. And there may be a few more people than that, indeed. But it's much best, even those who are really going to try to use it, it's good that they think of themselves that way and don't get all, take their vestigial, you know, absolutist habit pattern of self-identity and transfer it onto, now I'm Kalachakra, like, I'm not going to wash the dishes. <laughs> How can I wash this with my 24 arms or I might break them all? You know, ridiculous. But I know some people who behave like that. I do. So, um, okay. So, and there's, yeah, there's a focus on, the, on this one. And uh, I just love it, I must say. I do love the palette. The Caltech of palette, this is where it shows all the different things in the hands, you know. There are the things, you know, when you start to learn it, you use things like that. You know. Okay, any question? Any questions? Anybody have any questions? Yes? Is, is, is the empowerment required to do that kind of experiential huh. exercise that you're describing? Yes, it does. And that's why people keep taking it again and again, because <laughs> you get lost in it, actually, a little bit. But the only one I know who had a real glimpse of it was my wife. She's always, I'm, I'm so jealous, but I can't help it. But anyway, it's good that I am. It's good that she's way beyond me. She. I can tell from her description she had that she really had a glimpse of it all. And it is, a, it is really amazing. You know, you get reborn again and again in the initiation. You, know, you dissolve, then you arise in a Buddha body, then you float over and you go into the mouth of the Kala Chakra, and then you're born from the womb of the female part of the Kala Chakra, and then you're placed, and you're placed in the mandala, and then this and that, and then this and that, the deities come. The shaktis come and they fix your turban and they put your hat on and all this kind of stuff. And you can't, almost impossible to follow it unless you really know all the iconography and, you know. So, the, the, you know, once you're an adept, when you, then you, again you get him. Actually, I don't like the word empowerment also, by the way. I don't like that word. People wrongly think that this tantric thing, somehow there's some power coming to you. It's just like you're gassing up at the, <laughs> you know, at the pump, you know, it's like in-flight refueling, you know. Huh? from the Lama, but that's not correct. The Wang Kurwa, the word for, that is translated Wang Kurwa in Tibetan, which means conferral, Wang by itself can mean power, but it also is short for Wang Bo, which means a prince. So conference, conferral of princedom. And the Sanskrit word is Abhisheka, which means a, an anointment. So it's actually like a coronation ceremony. Now, when you coronate a crown prince, you know, by sort of place that they are, then eventually can become a king. But they didn't get an extra power by being coronated. They just occupied a certain position, in a way, a position of a potential power, but they don't get power in the initiation. They get anointed, you know. And so, uh, because of the ambiguity in Tibetan, if you leave out the suffix particle, wang po, which means a prince, Indra. You know, it's a translation of Indra. Uh, and this means the conferral of the prince the on a prince, which you do by anointing the prince in a coronation ceremony, right? So, so when we, the, the, way we've, the way that some Tibetans have translated it and Tibetan scholars translate it, empowerment, it gives people the wrong idea that I gotta go get more initiations because I'm getting more power every initiation I get, which actually is the opposite. Every initiation, you This video was 
brought to you in part with the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit Tibet House U.S., including invites to special trips to study Buddhism up close and personal with Robert Thurman during his annual geographic expedition trips. Trips in 2018 include Mongolia and Bhutan. To learn more, visit BobThurman.com.